you are tomorrow's patient if you're not today. You are. Yeah. We are all dying of liver disease, heart disease, Alzheimer's, kidney disease. Whatever your shortest fuse is, is the way that you expressed it. And I thought, wow, that's brilliant. Because yeah. we are all dying. We all know we're dying, but we don't think about it. We try to push it away. Yeah. What is your shortest fuse is what's going to get you, you know? Um, and when you think about it in that terms, like, you know, like I've, smash the crap out of my kidneys because I've run too many ultra marathons, you know, so my kidney function is not as worse than my mother's, you know? Um, and so I know that's probably one of my short fuses that I'm going to have to attend to somehow. Um, and, and we all have these things going on. Can, can you explain that a little bit so that people get that concept of we can actually take this and do something now. We don't have to just age like our parents and grandparents have we've got the chance like you and me in our fifties. Yeah. You know, like hurry up, let's get these regulations. Changed. So for, for all intensive purposes, the, the best way to explain it is at the cellular level, there are what we call hallmarks of aging. And today there's 12 agreed upon hallmarks of aging scientifically. That means they've been peer reviewed. And we know that these are the processes that are happening at the cellular level that lead to our cells basically collecting damage. What is aging but cellular degeneration over time? And what happens is because the mechanisms at the cellular level uh, become more dysfunctional, um, our cells are not able to repair the damage. They're not able to divide enough to uh, save us. And we get things like uh, immune senescence, as, which mm -hmm. is a reason that a lot of people died of COVID. Uh, we get things like genomic instability, which is why people die of cancer. Uh, we get things like nutrient sensing issues and other issues that lead to cardiovascular diseases. And so even though this list is going to grow over time, uh, it gives us targets for, for gene therapy. And so the genes that I introduced uh, the conversation to, and we can talk about reprogramming genes that mm. basically look uh, epigenetic changes or, or a variety of them. There, there, we have a, a big uh, pile of genes now that are associated with aging, but we look at genes that will target these hallmarks of aging. And so, you know, how many three-year-olds uh, get dementia hmm. or 20-year-olds? Yeah. Well, they, well, they don't. And it's because their cells are youthful and they're still repairing damage. So when we look at the trajectory of disease, we see that about the age of 45, it's younger than most people think, uh, the death curve really starts growing. So you mm -hmm. can think of it as a drop off or you think of it going up. Let's think of it as a drop off. So around 45, it starts dropping and then 50% of the population is dead in uh, around you know 80. And then it continues to drop quite uh, steeply. And then very, very, very few people live to this 110 sort of what we considered uh, ultimate lifespan. And um, so what's happening in there, uh, biological aging is pushing all these processes. So your shortest fuse, uh, the disease that you're diagnosed with uh, that kills you um, is different from person to person, but all of the same diseases and risks are growing at the same time. So let me put this into perspective. When we look at things like dementia hits around 65 in the population, uh, kidney failure around 75 uh, for most people, cancer starts falling around you know, the mid forties and then uh, exponentially kills more people. Um, if you took any one of these diseases and you cured it on its own. So that's been sort of our, so, you know, when we think about it, everybody's into longevity because we've all supported the American Heart Association, the, you know, the, the dementia associations, uh, the cancer associations, you know, we all support a cure for each one of these diseases. Historically, what we've done in medicine is we've said, you've got cancer, now we're going to go after a tumor and try to ablate it and, and, and save you, or we're going to go after a blood cancer, or, or you have uh, dementia, so we're going to go after cognitive enhancement and try to reduce beta amyloid plaques. And of course, that's why the the, the um, industry mm. didn't move for a long time, because yeah, that millions. actually help people. Um, so they go after treating a symptom. Well, let's just say, let's let's put in our mind that we went after cancer and we cured it let's say we cured all of cancer, you only live two years longer. 
exactly. The whole, population. The whole on, on average, the population of the next on two average, years, two to four years, because these diseases run in parallel. And that's why people over 65 usually have multiple morbidity diseases. Yep. They, mm. they basically have a form of heart failure. They, their kidneys are failing. They have some, um, level of dementia on a scale they've lost some cognitive ability and that they're at increased risk of cancer mm -hmm. so when we look at treating aging at the cellular level we actually look at eradicating all of those diseases at the same time it just just amazing i mean that the thought of that in, in rather than going after the band-aid or the one specific disease and to actually get to the root cause and not to say that that's simple because like you said there's multiple genes involved it's not one single one but it is like you know again giving you just a quick example with mum we had what looked like a tia a small stroke uh about three four months ago and so we were putting in um well, I put in some natto kinase to uh get rid of the clots right and um in conjunction with her doctors and um a couple of weeks later she had a GI bleed because there was another area letting go now the fact that we put in the natto kinase was problematic right because you know this other pipe was letting go down here the clots were causing a problem up here. And so you start like to have... plug holes and running out of fingers. Yeah, and one is contra to the other one, you know, the clotting versus the bleeding risk in this case. And that's a sort of very complex situation that you're dealing with when someone has these multi-comorbidities that, that, are, that are going on. And, and uh, you know, one of the things that I've you know, heard over and over again from people meaning well, like, why don't you just let it go? Why, why, why are you fighting so hard? And I'm going, well, because you're a you damn long for? time dead, <laughs> you know. And because what would you fight for, yeah, if it wasn't for the people you love, what would you fight for? Your bike, yeah, exactly. Your car, I mean, literally, what would you fight for if you wouldn't fight for another person? Yeah, and she has a quality of life. I mean, we just got got her through an E. coli infection, which was horrific. And when I was in the trenches in the last six weeks fighting to keep her alive and keep her out of the hospital and do all the things that I needed to do to keep her going. And people were like, well, maybe it's just time. You know, well, now we're six weeks later. She's improving again. And I've stuck more things into her protocol. I'm actually really excited, uh, Dr. Day and Goodenow's work. I don't know if you've come across him, but with plasmalogens and the, the work that we're doing. So I'm trying that. And she's actually better now than she was two months ago. I saw a group doing that in the US. They actually had an open study and they were um, using uh, plasma. Uh, this was from young people, but it's a special part of the plasma. Mm -hmm. And they claim that they're getting uh, really uh, beneficial outcomes. Well, With gene therapy, of course, our hope is to make your cells behave youthfully. So therefore um, you are creating uh, a more youthful plasma but you know in the meantime whilst we're waiting for this exactly. very expensive research to be done I definitely think that's a great thing to get involved yeah in. no, this was actually plasmalogens plasmalogens are um I won't go into because we'll, we'll sidetrack ourselves but I'll tell you about the master but this is also you know but again we, we, you've gone a step higher if you like in the hierarchy of where the problems are coming from these wonderful other things that we can do meanwhile, because we have access to them now, great. And I do think it's going to be a multi-pronged approach. We're going to need a bit of steam cell theory, we're gonna, therapy. We're going to need exercise. We're going to need diet and lifestyle. We're going to need the right uh, supplements. We're going to need various aspects while you're solving this problem. You know, you and your company and many of these wonderful scientists that are working in this field solve the actual bigger things all of these other downstream things we need to be doing now to maintain and that's what I talk to my you know clients about is like hold your shit together now because the stuff that's coming <laughs> is going to be next level and if you can keep your body in some relatively good shape now you're going to be able to benefit from that in five to ten years so that's a real good goal for people to go after yeah yeah, and I and I think that it will become uh, more more afford affordable. But what you're going to see is a lot of these therapies moving towards offshore access uh, mm. rather than um, a lot of them in clinical trials. 
just because a lot of the funders of these type of technologies have funded drugs that have gone through clinical trials and it can take 20 some years and you can only get it through for a specific indication. When we're looking at treating biological aging, um, a lot of people uh, think that the, the system is, is quite broken for looking at something with uh, multiple comorbidities. Exactly. And so um, that brings us to the point of medical tourism and having to go offshore. And your company works with um, integrated, I think it's integrated medical systems um, or health systems. Uh, integrated Integrative health systems. And, and that allows people to get access to some of these uh, gene therapies with their full consent and they're cooperating in the studies that you can then take that data and use that for your uh, regulatory fight, if you like. Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah that's how it works. So uh, our company can't treat patients directly, um, but doctors can. And there are doctors who are willing to uh, treat patients under consent. And that happens vastly in the medical tourism space, which is tour, uh, you know, traveling for medicine, uh, which has been popular for decades. And uh, it gives people the access to these therapies also at a fraction of the cost of what they might cost if they went through regulations. Now, we're hoping that what we can do with that data is make good drugs, get them through regulations and have affordable therapies. But right now, that hasn't been proven out by the gene therapy space. Mm. And so uh, that's some... because they have small markets and aging is a huge market and could be affordable for everyone. This is the key point. So you've got, I think uh, you said nine or 11 gene therapies that are currently um, approved and that are like muscular dystrophy or Duchenne's, I believe, and hemophilia, A and B and sickle cell anemia, I think is coming soon. And there's a few others, a handful of other really ra rather rare-ish um, genetic disorders that, that are already approved, but these are run by pharmaceutical companies and the gene therapies are $400,000, $500,000. So, oh, they're more. They're or more. Um, the, the cheapest gene therapy that's gotten through regulation is $425,000 to treat wow. one eye. $850,000 wow. want to treat both your eyes or you go blind. Um, the other gene therapies that you spoke of all start over a million and they go up to 5 million. So if your child was born today with spinal muscular atrophy, they'd have about six months uh, to get a therapy or die. And it costs between two and $5 million. And I don't know what the variation in that cost is, but that, that therapy could be given for a fraction of the cost. And so we're, we're here um, with our mindfulness, uh, with our eye on this industry, uh, and we have been pointing out what's wrong with it and yeah. how it doesn't need to be and why it's failing. And um, and sometimes I wonder if it's failing purposefully uh, to prove to the world that these drugs are too expensive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are oh. expensive to make, but they're a fraction of that cost, you know, 300,000, maybe not a million. Yeah. And in some of the therapies that you've actually tested on yourself and done on yourself, um, they're even a little bit less than, than those sorts of prices, aren't they? So that people can... Um, yeah, that's because they're they're not uh, an approved drug. Uh, they don't have to be... They For me, they weren't built at a, a standard uh, that the US FDA requires, which triples the cost of the therapy. And so um, oh. <laughs> of the four gene therapies I've taken, I've probably taken, I don't know, I'd say about $700,000 worth of gene therapies. But that's four different gene therapies, and two of them I took twice at pretty significant doses. So um, the comparison of one gene therapy for two to five million and uh, four gene therapies for 700,000. And then you have to realize that's by scale. If 100 people took the therapies that I took, they would be 50% less. If 1,000 people took them, they would be uh, significantly less, probably 60% less. So, and when we're talking about aging, we're talking about everyone, we're talking about potentially therapies that treat biological aging that come in less than $10,000 and you only have to take the therapy once every, you know, five to 10 years and governments would be paying for that. You know, I mean, certainly if we have a cure for aging, you won't bear the burden of the cost. 
Wow. And so this is where the, the democratization of these therapies is one of your goals so that you're not oh, just catering to the super wealthy who can afford these things, which is where it's at currently, even with these specific uh, FDA approved ones for. And if you've got a child with Duchenne's and you can't get the one to five million dollars raised to, to, to make that happen, isn't that tragic? You know, like, isn't that just such a... You, your yeah. your life is, is basically a disaster. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it should not come down to, but the reality is we live in this space and you've got to start with democratization process. And that means getting it accepted, getting the word out there, doing these types of podcasts and getting the word out so that you, the listener, can start to demand some of these things and make change Absolutely. happen. And I work in on regulations. Uh, so we have laws. Your spare that time. Create- any country in the world and help them get a pre-regulatory regulatory regulatory, uh, zone going. So what that means is uh, patient-centric, patient-minded access. And um, this helps companies come in, universities come in, even pharma come in with their gene therapies, gene and cell therapies, tissue engineering, and start helping patients right now. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, your government could sign off on that and have that through uh, by the end of the year. And these are the the type of regulatory paths we're looking for, because it really isn't just the fault of the U.S. FDA. Clearly, it's not set up to do this correctly. But if we were bringing them human data from moral, ethical and legal run studies, then they would have a much smoother process. Today, we're asked to, you know, seven to 12 million dollars of animal data uh, and we put that over their desk and say, you know, approve this for a, a human phase one study. They have to assess, well, will this even work in a human? And then they become very risk averse because they can lose their jobs over it. But with these pre-regulatory routes, we could bring them human data that could speed up the entire process, ensuring that everyone gets access to these technologies that have a certain number of years uh, left in their lives. And I would, you know, again, you will all be patient. So please um, sign these petitions. We have one called um, it's bestchoicemedicine.com we'll or the best, link. bestchoicemedicine.org. Mm-hmm. And, and you can uh, go to that and you can sign the petition from anywhere in the world. And it gives us more ability to start the conversation with governments. If you know government officials, get us in front of them. Uh, we can We can bring the law. We can show them how it would work. We can help them build the committees that oversee. Um, This is, it's critical. It's critical that you get access to a technology as soon as you need it. And the truth is with most of these gene therapies, you'd be better off getting them before you need them. So that's how much time is of the essence. Totally. And, you know, like if if I, if if I was able to, I would give mum all of these therapies right now. You know, this is this, because when you're when you're at that point where you, nothing, you know, you, you're pushing the proverbial uphill, you why not throw things at it, you know? And so there should be a route for us to do that, um, you know. And 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 I can't travel with her, and I can't I can't afford millions of dollars. Um, but if there was an option and I was able to do that in my own country, then that would be absolutely amazing. So let's talk offline about how I and if, can help And if you can legally do that, you'll have nonprofits that will come forward and help patients get access because, you know, they're, they're big stakeholders in the process as well. Wow. So you know, having payers and even the government as a payer to find out if therapies work, um, that, that can help people who can't afford them get access to them. And um, I can't tell you how important that is for everyone. For everyone listening, you're all aging. Everyone. You are all a part of this. This is this is your future. So yeah, you know, and we we should not leave our children with these diseases. Mm. You know, the big game changer in medicine, and and there's a whole bunch of people who don't want to hear this uh, because of COVID, but our immunizations and antibiotics. It was it's the reason why we die of aging. It was the biggest advancement that happened until the advancements in gene therapy. And so we're ready to take that next big step up of, you know, you no longer die of of the things like, you know, the the black plague and things like that that we died of before because, you know, we we started to learn viral 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 I can't even say it. <laughs> virology. <laughs> virology. I couldn't even say it. Um it just was like not going to come out. And we learned <laughs> 
germ theory and uh, antibiotics. I mean, I mean, most of us are alive because of some bout of antibiotics, whether or not that we want to believe that or not. And so um, these big game changers, you know, came in and now it's time to change the game again and uh, not just treat the symptoms of disease, not just go to palliative care and throw our hands up and say it's too expensive to make a drug, but actually find innovative ways to make drugs and get them to people. Absolutely. I mean, drug innovations in science are here for people to translate to patients. Um, if you looked at the way businesses run today, you would think that that wasn't the case, that it's about profits, that it's about who you know, um, that it's about the minority, very, very few people who have a lot of money to fund every innovation because, you know, I mean, we can't even get to space without private industry now. Mm. We have our hands out to the same people over and over again. And we wonder why these, why these innovations don't come to the public. You have to demand access, demand that uh, the governments get in there, make the right laws and do the right funding for the right reasons. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And this is the next frontier of things that could absolutely revolutionize. And then, you know, you've got this whole, um, I get this argument all the time, well, then we'll have too many people on the planet you know, and it's like, well, are you willing to bugger off? Um, or how about we just yeah. solve some of the bigger problems that uh, that do come along with population growth, which we are able to solve if we put our minds to it, rather than let's knock off half of the population or let's not have, you know, those those approaches. And they're never those people that are willing to go off themselves. That, that right, yeah, that. it's like... So do you, if you know, you will eventually get dementia if you live long enough enough. So do you want to die of dementia? Oh no, you don't want to die of dementia, but you think that it's okay that a bunch of people do now. And there's a lot of uh, generational uh, debates of, you know, the boomers and the gen these and the gen those, and <laughs> you know, it, there's a lot of divide and divisiveness that has been sort of drawn up as an example of, of how we can't all live peacefully together. But if there's a cure for aging and complex disorder, um, then anything less than that is murder. And so who are you in, in this situation? Uh, do you vote for slavery or against slavery? Because this, this is this defining moment. So if there is a cure, would you choose not to cure people? Um, that, that's, that's, that's pretty bad. And, and, and probably, you know, um, those people need to walk out because, you know, they're not good players in the world. Yeah. Um, but population is, is actually a thing that is already being dealt with in almost every industrialized country in the world. The um, birth rate actually is down. So the replacement rate is down. If you go to Hong Kong, one of the l longest lived populations, there are almost no children there. Wow. Uh, Japan, they have so few children, they don't have caretakers. Now, I love children. Wow. I'm a mom and I love children. This isn't against that. It's just that when you give people um, longer lifespans, they don't choose for the same things. Clearly, uh, we see that in in the uh, the numbers. And so there's a plateau that we're coming to where the whole world's population will essentially stall out and there'll be a, a specific number of people, but we will be burdened uh, by the aging and the sick. And so financially, we can't afford it. Um, certainly, uh, children who are born today don't want to spend their entire adult life taking care of old sick people. Um, so there's, there's a lot of ethics reasons around it. But number one, don't be a murderer. Uh, don't, don't, you know, just, you know, not think things out and say, well, I guess people yeah. need to die because we have too many people on the planet that's been debunked over and over. And, uh, what we can do in fact is as we have, uh, technologies work in parallel. And so other technologies are solving the bigger problems that are happening with that. And I always say the great thing about knowing about global climate change is that we know we measured it because we cared. And we're going to do something about it because we care. It's not an overnight uh, solution, but people are working on solutions to these problems. And if we weren't, um, you know, if we were just kind of looking out and saying, oh, it looks different this year. And we didn't have all this marked science that bookmarks exactly when these changes are happening, what they might be associated to, then I would be worried. So, um, you know, the, 
the survival of our species should be important and the survival of everything that we can save at this point should be important. And I think that, you know, we will drive that most significantly through genetics. Yeah. And we will have, um, you know, w you know, new technologies that are going to take care of some of the problems, but this is, this is another argument too, is that, you know, I'm 55. I've taken a lot of time to get to this level of abilities, intelligence and education and skill set development if you like all of us have and what am I starting to meet to meet to start declining now and then I'm yeah. all of that is lost if I oh, die yeah. tomorrow you know all of that and then we have to start at scratch going through the school system going to development you know as we as we all as we all do but then wouldn't it be better if I worked for another 40 50 years with my in, in your intelligence and skills and things and actually contributed to society what we that's proven that's, yeah. that's called, the, I mean, if you look back at history, that's called the industrial revolution. <laughs> and what happened is people in different places of the world lived long enough to become skilled labor, labor and lived long enough to actually do that labor to make big changes in the world. Uh, it was a dirty time with dirty energy and we're recovering from that, but that, that's, a, that's a product of lifespan. And as we see uh, different countries in the world are being lifted up, uh, you'll see, you know, workers and teleworkers coming from certain areas because they live long enough now to mm. learn a skill and to do it for some number of decades. And so that's where it becomes very valuable to society because they get better and better at doing it. So with a new lifespan extension, we, we would hope to see uh, what we expect, which is another revolution in technology. And it will be all designed towards survival, which means cleaner air, cleaner water, a better environment. You know, we have trillions of cells in our body. The one cell that we all depend upon is the earth and its atmosphere. You can think of it very much like a cell. Hmm. And um, it will give us time to solve those problems and have people who have trained long enough to see patterns and break them yeah yeah and to learn from our history and I think you know I just think this whole if we if we're just able to live longer and healthier before we do eventually drop off a cliff and die but if that if that time is compressed and we don't like I've lived eight years or I have my mum who I love dearly and now but now she's 24 7 care and that means that I'm, you know, running a number of companies and trying to look after her and blowing myself to pieces um, in order to give her the quality of life. If 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 she hadn't had those things at the beginning and was able still to work and contribute and 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 do all of those things, then she'd be still contributing to society now, you know. Um, uh, and, and, and there's like the two sides there's there's um you know the thing that we think of is a natural duration and then there's like kind of fate. And the thing is that people from our time uh, will have a certain tenacity because we faced these problems. And I hope that your mother survives and lives another 300 another. years. Exactly. Um, yeah. But the things that you have gone through have grown you as a person, uh, made you learn, forced you into uncomfortable spaces, um, as happened to me as well. And this actually molded us by fire. And that's, we will always carry that um, and be able to get more done because we have, we understand um, time. And people from our generations will understand time. Hopefully we'll be able to talk to young people in the future about what it was like knowing that you were slowly dying. Yeah, and that it will be hopefully a thing of the past.